Okay. And so just so everyone's aware, this uh, pro this webinar series started as part of a paper funded project. And so, and so Clemus is part of the University of Arizona, and we have uh, team members in New Mexico as well, but it's a NOAA-funded regional integrated science assessment center. And what our project was looking at was evaluating the use of urban heat island maps and urban planning. And one of the things that we heard from our partner communities quite a bit was that they wanted to just see what other communities were doing in the area of heat mapping. So, um, so this is kind of where the webinar series started from, and we have another uh, speaker next month already lined up. Um, but for the research team of this project, it was myself. I'm an assistant professor in planning at the University of Arizona. We have Ben McMahon, who is a Clemus research affiliate. And then our graduate research assistant, Tess Wagner, who most of you have probably been getting the emails from. So for any more information on this project, please go ahead and email me at lad.arizona.edu. Next slide, Tess. And we just do want to thank um, all of the communities that have been participating in this research project. And so we've been working on um, identifying and kind of evaluating uh, different uses of urban heat island maps in communities. And so you see the list of those under there, under the case study communities. And Reed Meyer was um, one of those uh, partners that worked with us on helping us identify how urban heat islands are being used across um, the Southwest. And then we also have partner communities, which are the ones that we delivered new urban heat island maps to. And so that was Avondale and Bafka in Arizona, Doña Ana County in New Mexico, and the city of Santa Fe in New Mexico. So we want to thank all of them for their continued support and help with this project. Next slide. And just a couple of webinar logistics. So we are using Zoom. Um, please keep your webcams and microphones off so that we don't have any feedback when need get started. Um, she'll be presenting for about 15 or 20 minutes, I think, and then we'll have uh, questions and answers after. And if you could go ahead and just use the chat function and I'll moderate the questions and answers from that. Um, and you can open that up by pressing Alt-H or um, just kind of, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom, there's a little chat icon that you can click on. Okay, next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mead, um, just a really short introduction, and she might uh, be able to talk about her own work a little bit better than I can, but Mead is a sustainability coordinator with Pima Association of Governments in Tucson, Arizona, and she's been with PAG since 2006. Her experience is in the field of ecological research, watershed management, and urban planning, and she's been heavily involved with PAG's green infrastructure tool for quite a while now. And uh, through our case studies that we did, we found the PAG screen infrastructure tool um, that has the urban heat island map as a component of it was one of the longest standing publicly accessible um, heat island maps that we came across. So um, they've been working with it for quite some time. And so that's why we wanted to kind of showcase some of the stuff that they've been doing with it and um, some of the, and also some of the challenges. And she'll talk about some of the needs that they're looking to get filled in the future in the area of heat mapping. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Mead. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share our work. My role, as Lad mentioned, is more of a, a planner in this project. Um, so I've worked with technical experts and researchers to pool resources together um, because our goal at PAG is to um, promote data-driven decision-making for our Council of Governments. Um, for those less familiar with PAG, um, Pima Association of Governments, our role is to um, enhance cross-jurisdictional coordination. Um, we work with all the towns and cities, county and um, native nations in Pima County um, on issues that cross jurisdictional boundaries. So that includes transportation, water and air. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the things I thought I'd run through um, today with you are how we as PAG got uh, interested in heat data, a little bit about the setting of Tucson for those less familiar, um, I'd like to discuss how it, integrated planning is really what brought us to work with heat data, um, which data in particular we use for heat, and also our green infrastructure tool, which is the, the tool we use in, um, to work with the heat data. 
And then I'd like to open it up to talk about what our next steps are and what some of the group's next steps are and how we could enhance each other's efforts. So next slide, thank you. Um, so a few of the ways that um, a group like PAG would take an interest in heat, I put up on the screen here. Um, first is when we created a pedestrian plan a few years ago, there were surveys included and one of the top demands for by pedestrians um, was um, that the public wants shade when they walk. Um, so those of you also from desert environments know how people are shade hoppers, jumping from one area to the next where they can retreat in the shade. Um, another one um, concern is uh, health-related concerns. Um, we know from the Arizona Health Services Department that he has a greater impact on populations with mobility restrictions. And this is really important to our transportation planners. Also, as far as our investments in street infrastructure, those areas that are more exposed to the sun um, are less, have a less um, life expectancy of the road itself. And we're always looking for more data on that if anybody has that available. I, I'm, I'm always gathering more information there. And then finally, the area that I work the most in is green infrastructure. So um, my interest in heat comes from this angle of um, stormwater management, which brought me the green infrastructure and then how heat mitigation is one of the main benefits of green infrastructure. And so I want to team up with those efforts. Um, for people who work a little less often in green infrastructure, the definition that I'm using um, to put it succinctly is um, stormwater harvesting plus vegetation. That kind of creates the picture of green infrastructure. Okay, next setting, next slide. This one is, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a intro into why heat is especially an issue in Pima County. So a little bit out of our local setting. As you can imagine, um, heat is an, is an accentuated concern in a desert environment. Um, I hope I don't butcher the statistic, but um, Arizona has something like the most cumulative deaths and heat related illnesses to residences, to residents um, over time. So it's, it's what the natural disaster that's of most concern to our region. Um, and we also know that those who are suffer the most from heat are live in impoverished areas. They might not have air conditioning. They might not have um, as much mobility to move out of, move to a cooling area, cooling location. And um, they also tend to have lower canopy in their neighborhoods. So those areas of poverty are a large concern to us. Uh, Tucson in particular is one of, is the second worst metro area in Western areas um, for poverty rates. And green infrastructure can be used to address many of these issues and several other concerns. Um, it can address water security issues. Um, it can address pedestrian safety by creating buffers. We also have, not to make it sound terrible, but um, we are FHWA pedestrian safety focused state because we do have high number of pedestrian deaths. So we are working to address these issues. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our green infrastructure prioritization tool. It's uh, just a screenshot of some of the layers on the tool. Um, this is where we have used our um, heat layer. Um, it was first published in 2012. It's publicly accessible. We made it so that it was user friendly for nonprofits, researchers, educators say, tell us that they use it, um, and planners. Um, it's really the result of many partnerships. Some of the data comes from PAG, um, others are, come from our, our partnering organizations. Next slide. Um, here's just a look at some of the layers on the map. Um, we have the surface temperature, 
We have heat vulnerable demographics that comes from the state um, health department. We have canopy cover that was processed at PAG using our um, LIDAR acquisitions. We have stormwater paths um, that was processed by our, um, the flood control district. Um, we address water quality concerns on there, pedestrian, biking and busing locations. Um, we also recently added a park score index for access to green space, riparian areas um, that create cool buffers and benefit from green infrastructure, and stormwater monitoring sites because green infrastructure addresses water quality. Next slide, please. This is a look at the heat layer. Um, we um, requested this data from Eve Halper. She had used it in her dissertation at the University of Arizona. Um, it was created, the data is from 2008. Um, it's the only data we had, we know of that's available for us to use on our tool, um, but it's from 10 a.m. and she used Landsat thermal um, in imagery to create this. Um, and um, the one reason this uh, year was valuable to us is um, we had li LIDAR data available the same, uh, for the same year and we wanted to match our um, tree canopy to heat data for the same year. Next slide, please. Um, one of our first municipal uses of this interactive map um, was by working with Irene Ogata at the city of Tucson. Um, and she was also, she was working at the time on establishing a campaign with the mayor for um, a tree planting campaign. Um, so several different priorities were discussed and what was landed on was selecting um, blocks that have above average heat and a below average tree canopy to prioritize where uh, planting efforts would occur. So there were realizations that this is, you know, we had limited heat data available. We were going off of just one data set, but I think what was most appreciated was the ability to focus efforts in areas that might have the greatest impact because there are limited resources for these tree planting efforts. Next slide, please. Here's a few more example uses of our tool, um, in particular, um, those who are concerned with heat. Um, I just mentioned the city of Tucson's campaign. Another more recent use was the county created a green infrastructure action plan in order to achieve um, a Paris climate agreement. So this was uh, they used similar parameters as a city, above average heat and below average canopy, but they also wanted to select county properties in addition for implementation on their properties. Um, Trees for Tucson continues to use it for where they do um, public tree plantings and outreach efforts. There's a group called Conserved Enhance that does community granting opportunities for green infrastructure and they use it to prioritize where their funding goes and, and selection of projects. And we recently highlighted the tool in our own green infrastructure plan. Um, so beyond these uses, I believe our, um, the use of the tool and the resulting analysis has influenced the creation of some of our regional council resolutions um, that support and encourage continued work in this area. Um, it's helped to educate the decision makers about the overlapping issues um, that he has with infrastructure and planning issues in our region. We've used the map for uh, mapping workshops. Um, it's assisted with design guidance and um, related return on investment studies. The heat layer in particular, heat data was a key component and one of our um, projects regionally on green infrastructure return on investment tools. Um, so those are just a few more ways that we've used heat data. Next slide. Um, 
um, we hope to continue to grow the use of the tool. Um, we've kept ongoing maintenance of it, um, but we're seeking additional funding to conduct our next canopy analysis, um, most likely on our 2015 LIDAR data set. Um, we also hope to enhance analytical components of the GI tool. So right now it mostly looks like a um, interactive map where you can turn on and off layers and zoom in. And we've done a lot of the analysis in-house, but we'd like to do a lot of summary statistics available on the fly if people use the tool and build that into the tool. So we're looking for granting and funding sources to do that. Um, then more people could select an area and, for example, see the number of trees needed to reach the 15% canopy goal or see the total impervious area or percent percentage for an area or see the level of heat, heat concerns for that area. Um, and of course, we hope for more heat imagery as it becomes available. Next slide, please. Um, and I threw out a few desires that I've heard people speak about um, wanting as far as additional heat um, data. It would be great to know what our um, areas with greatest diurnal fluctuation are. So currently we've been using the 10 a.m. data set and if we could look at the, the coolest time of night and the hottest time of day and to see where the heat is most retained during the night, that would be very valuable for health concerns and for the um, concerns of urban impact. In an aired environment, we normally have um, cool nights. Um, and so that's sort of lost when we have these greater impervious areas. Um, we'd love to look at the variation between the seasons, especially what it looks like in the hottest time of year. Our current date is from May. And of course, to look at the long-term change since, um, at least since 2008, which is our current data set. Um, since we compare it to tree data, when we're doing potentially more tree data in, uh, on our 2015 data set, it might be um, really valuable to find a 2015 heat data set to compare to. Next slide, please. This is just a side note. I wanted to mention in case it aided discussion. Um, Josh Pope, our GIS manager, when looking at um, potential data sources for looking at the impact of sun exposure and heat, um, was experimenting with um, some shade analysis. Um, and so this, what you're looking at is not actually a temperature um, surface temperature data set. What it is is in red is where there's full a full day of sun exposure and where there's blue there's shade all day. Um, and while this isn't representing heat, it, it was interesting to me um, that, and it was interesting to the transportation planners that um, the north south streets benefited the most from tree canopy efforts because they were they received the most shade, resulting shade in a day, whereas the east-west streets were exposed all day long and didn't benefit as much from the tree canopy. Um, this data set isn't available on our, our tool. We ended up not using it. We ended up opting for the six feet, six foot tree canopy data instead. But if you go to the next slide, I thought a group like this would appreciate how that compares, that sun exposure compares to the surface temperatures and how resulting air temperature data, if you compare that, that might be an interesting to, thing to look at comparing um, that park in the upper left, how it's so cool and the surface temperature where the grass is, but it still has the full sun exposure that you see in the upper left of the shade analysis. Next slide, please. Here are a few resources for you. Um, that's a link to our prioritization tool where you can look at our heat map. Um, um, Eve Helper's dissertation is noted there if you're interested in that. And I have my contact information up there. Um, and I did want to mention during our discussion, 
that. Um, could you go back on two slides? One more. Okay, here it is. Um, Vlad had asked me if there was any other unique strategies resulting from heat, um, or use of heat, or use of heat data. And I wanted to just state up front that I'm really only familiar with the green infrastructure discussions. But if you do explore this data, there's a lot of interesting things that pop out um, where you see red tile roofs, um, streets, parking lots, dry riverbeds. Those are all the hot spots on the map. Um, and where you see cool um, blue t colors, that's the lush vegetation, including parks, vegetated washes, and neighborhoods with trees, as well as the white roofs, those turn up blue. Um, so that's it for my presentation. I'd be happy to discuss more with you. Great, thank you so much, Mead. Um, if you have any questions, and I'm seeing a couple pop up, but just a reminder, just type them in the group chat. We have Mead for just a little bit longer with us. So I see one question from uh, Sarah at the city of Tucson asking if the data can be exported, Mead. Oh, um, yeah, we have a, we have a um, method written up if people are curious about exploring the data on their own computers. Um, so you can just contact me and I can connect you with our GIS manager who has been able to help people, especially if you're one of our member jurisdictions, then we don't tend to have a charge for um, data sharing. Great, thank you. Another question from Hunter Jones at NOAA's Climate Program Office is if you've considered incorporating health data such as uh, syndromic surveillance information or emergency calls into the vulnerability analysis. Could you name those data sets again? Yeah, so it looks like incorporating health data like um, syndromic surveillance information or emergency calls into the vulnerability analysis. I had not um, come across that before, but I think um, we're always open to adding more um, layers to the tool that would be help it make it more meaningful to the end users. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll add in me just this morning, I was at the Pima County Public Health Department, and um, they're getting ready for uh, kind of a one, one health heat campaign um, through a CDC grant that they received. And um, they, they absolutely mentioned the green infrastructure prioritization tool was something that they were looking at, so. Oh, great. Yeah, so yet, a, yet another use just because it's publicly available, so. That's great. Let's see, Has a, have another question. So Mary Reynolds is asking if there's been an analysis kind of comparing the walk score to neighborhood shade. The walk score to the neighborhood shape? Neighbor, neighborhood shade. Oh, sorry, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's see. No, I don't. Not that I'm familiar with. Okay, Great. that's a good idea. And we're just so everyone knows, we're taking notes here too. So if some of these turn out to be things that the U of A can help with, we'll definitely see if we can get students on some of those. So, and we have um, someone from New York City is asking. Uh, you mentioned red tile roofs are hotter spots. So um, just kind of the question is, have you included building material data in this analysis? Oh, that was just um, <coughs> a cursory look at it. So it wasn't a strict analysis of, um, you know, what type of surface was, was hotter. It was just like looking looking through the map and you you can see these neighborhoods that are really hot despite having trees mm -hmm. and they tend to have the, the red tile roofs. But that's a good idea to, to establish that. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Mead, I have a question for you. Since we um, developed a few heat maps for other communities in the Southwest and they've just been delivered them and they're 
kind of deciding where to host them and how to incorporate them into existing, maybe like web GIS platforms. Do you have any advice for new communities that have just received an urban heat island map? Just based on the fact that PAG has hosted yours for such a long time? Um, just in general, um, I think a lot of our end users have found it useful that we created um, a, a print function that allowed people to, you know, see the legend and their area of interest. Um, we created a guide that's about the usefulness of the tool and the current uses of the tool and, and how to walk yourself through it. So I think those are pretty essential for the end user to know what to do with it. Um, I think we've gotten a lot out of um, presenting it around. Sometimes people are afraid to jump into it until they've, they've visually seen somebody walk them through it. Okay. Have you had any challenges with where it's hosted? Because it is on a green infrastructure tool. Um, has, has that changed the way that um, any of the users might be looking at it versus if it was kind of in um, like a zoning map or something that had other types of information? Oh, um, yeah, I could see how that would help people focus on particular issues at a time. Um, for instance, we did create a separate interactive map for um, a water reliability study. So it had some of the same layers, but a little bit different focus on um, areas of concern to water, but it, they wanted to include some of the green infrastructure layers. Um, so it, it does make sense to, you know, if we really amped up our work on urban heat to mm -hmm. cater to that. Okay, great. Any last questions for Mead? Okay, looks like we have two more. So um, let's see. So uh, Mead, one question is, how is the vulnerable population determined? So do you want to talk a little bit about just how the, the vulnerable population layer was created? Okay. Yeah, that one, um, we got a map from the Arizona Health Services Department. And their parameters, we have a metadata um, guidance too that we created for the tool, which I recommend everyone creating if you don't have one yet for your own interactive maps. But um, I know it included several factors that the health department found um, were related to heat. What the three that I always come <laughs> that I always mention are. Um, those that are mobility restricted, those that are impoverished. Um, I think ice, they, there's one that's considered like um, socially isolated. So they might be like, might be their mobility or it might be their, um, maybe they don't speak English, those kind of factors. So if they're socially isolated, they're less safe in a heat event. Okay, great. Um, and have two last questions and then we'll end it with these. So um, first to la or second to last question. So from Buckeye, are you aware of any other member jurisdictions from PAG or agencies using this data and the analysis of their plans? Um, using it in their plans, was that how it's raised? Yeah, so is any other member jurisdictions or agencies using this data in their in their plans or their planning processes that you know the of? The two that I'm most familiar with, um, they, they have a lot of resources to work with. These kinds of things are City of Tucson and Pima County. So the county's um, climate um, mitigation plan, I think they call it climate mitigation and adaptation plan, something like that. Um, they did look at heat issues related to that. Um, and the city and county have also used it. Um, they have ongoing use of some return on investment tools for green infrastructure. So they want to know what are the social, economic and environmental benefits of their projects and heat data goes into that and it's it's calculated into um, uh, the the social I think it's considered the value of a life 
so the value of, of mitigating heat to protect our, our health. Um, Great, thank you. Then, so they're, they're using it that way. And then last question from Daphne Lundy in New York City. Um, so she says, building off of LAD zoning point, has green infrastructure priority areas influenced how the developers building those areas? Um, and then to put it another way, are, uh, is there any way that you can think of to encourage developers to provide more green infrastructure if they're building in a priority area that's identified on the map? Oh, I haven't worked in the area of, of policies or incentives for for builders. Um, I think that would be something maybe Irene Ogata might be mm -hmm. more familiar with. I think it would be great to invite her as a speaker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'll say just through and our I know history. she's more familiar with how they consider it within um, rezoning and, and those types of issues. Yeah, and I, I know through our case study work, um, looking, talking to um, folks like Irene Ogata at Tucson Water in the city of Tucson, um, they are using the map to review um, the landscaping of plants that are coming through, although it's hard to bridge the kind of um, legal requirements of it right now, but they do use it as supporting evidence for projects if they if they think that um, based on the site and the heat, if it needs more trees or more green infrastructure. So, so I know at this point that they are using it as a, um, you know, potentially as um, supporting evidence, but it's hard to kind of make the legal jump to require it just based off of the map. So that's kind of what I've heard on that. So, great, well, thank you so much, Mead. Um, any, any final words, Mead, before we wrap everything up? Really appreciate you sharing your experiences with the map. Oh yeah, thank you for everybody's questions too that helped prompt some ideas of how we could take some next steps and um, I'll stay tuned to what comes next in your series. Great, thank you so much. Tess, if you could go to the next slide and I'll wrap things up pretty quickly here for folks. Um, so we do have another speaker lined up for next month now. So this is Matt Roach, who is with our epidemiology program in the Arizona Department of Health Services. So he's been a big leader in the Phoenix region on kind of the heat health connection. So next month he's going to present um, what the state's doing with their environmental public health tracking portal and kind of how the state is really leading the way in tracking the heat um, health impacts. Um, and so he's gonna talk about that portal, but then also his work um, in the Phoenix region more broadly. So that's on Wednesday, August 28th, and we have them at noon um, Arizona time or 3 p.m. Eastern. And again, if um, you guys, if anybody who's, who's joined us is not on our list, just go ahead and send me an email, lab at arizona.edu to be added to our list. So thanks again for joining us and um, just go ahead and uh, email if you have any other questions about this webinar series or um, if you need to get in touch with me for any of the things that she talked about.